Welcome to Ascension of the Chessmen, diving into the esoteric, occult, spiritual, and conspiratorial aspects of life, focused on solutions to the problems we face in our everyday lives. Let us ascend above all differences. Let us be the light in darkness, a breath of fresh air to those who can hardly breathe, and together, awaken into greatness. This is Ascension of the Chessmen with your host, Andre Mitty. Welcome to the Ascension of the Chessmen podcast. I'm your host, Andre Mitty. Today's guest is an, an intuitive visionary and quantum healer with over 22 years of assisting clients and realizing lasting life fulfillment and understanding the nature of who they are, energy. Ladies and gentlemen, hobbits and fairies, give a warm welcome to Amira Hall. Hi, and thank you so much for having me. It's a real exciting moment for me to be with you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. And I just want to thank you so much for coming on and so happy to have you. Thanks. What's so it looks like we've got some common themes here in terms of awakening, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy how we all get there, right? Yeah, it's it's fabulous. And it never ceases to amaze me. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, we all have our own story to tell. And each is unique to ourselves. And, uh, you know, I think if we all had the same story, it'd, <laughs> it'd be a boring one. Because <laughs> there'd be no surprises, there'd be no ups and downs, peaks and valleys, you know, it, it makes it all worth it. Well, you know, what I find interesting is it's so it's so common in a conversation with so many people these days, ascension or awakening. Mm. When I started mine, there was no conversation about it. That's how long I've been on the journey. Yeah. So yeah. I would say I've been on the journey almost 40 years. Um, always been curious, but you know, when, when things start happening, when you start breaking out of your shell, so to speak, I feel like in some ways I'm like a little bird inside of an egg or a cocoon or a butterfly mm -hmm. in a cocoon. We start poking our way out of the shell. Right. It's pretty scary. It's un, un, uncertain. It's, um, and so it's wonderful having so many people like yourself that are openly talking about it and, and making it okay, making it comfortable, making it less frightening yeah. for other people as they awaken and have their own journey and experience. But yeah, you know, um, so, so we're very fortunate in this time, I think, to have the exposure and the access to various speakers and information and yeah. What a person to look for on the, on the way of awakening. Right. I couldn't agree more. And, uh, you know, Amir, my, my first question for every guest is always, and you were kind of alluding to this already, but, uh, for those who aren't familiar, can you explain what it is that you do? And I guess what woke you up to realizing maybe there's more to this life than you were originally taught or thought? Well, you know, it really is poignant in terms of what's going on right now with all of us in this pandemic situation. Yeah. Um, I'm going to call it that, not that I agree with it. Okay. Right. Um, I, I guess you could say I've had several um, really pivotal times in, on my journey of awakening. Right. And so a lot of people, I don't know, there's a wide range of descriptions of what people think awakening is. For me, you know, I had been on a path. I was in corporate America. I was in a, in a successful six-figure um, sales path and career. That was back in nine, um, 1990. And what happened, and I find this is very typical for a lot of people, is you have a, a, a life-altering experience. My dad died. I was going through a divorce at the very same time within about six months of each other. The divorce was, you know, already in process, but you know, how that goes. Yeah, tough and time. then yeah. I was diagnosed. I went to see my doctor because I had this perpetual flu and the doctor sent me home, basically said, go home and prepare your, your, your affairs because you're going to end up dying or you're going to end up in a wheelchair. 
So that pushed me into such a deep state of depression. And within a, a very short amount of time, I got terminated because back then in the nineties, they, they did stuff like that, you know? Yeah. And so I couldn't show up in my sales work. And even though I was a really productive award-winning um, leader, they just canned me. Yeah. So there I was. I, I'm, I was actually born in Canada, so I had only been in the United States for four years. I was now divorced. I had no family. I had no support system. And if it wasn't for my dad's death, I wouldn't have a cent. I was really in what I call a rock bottom. Um, no family from Canada came to visit or rescue me or assist me. So I had to figure it out on my own. And after crying for about two weeks, trying to figure out, you know, my next move, that's when I shut the door on mainstream medicine, mm. on allopathic medicine. Yes. That's when I started to learn the system wasn't helping me. And it only gave me a cookie cutter of solutions. And actually, they did me a favor because there were no solutions for me. At the end, somebody diagnosed me with chronic fatigue syndrome. And today there's, you know, millions of people around the world with chronic fatigue or, or you know, irritable bowel or auto, any autoimmune issue is thrown into a particular category. And, and some people are sort of left to die or, or, or figure it out or not figure it out, just suffer with all the pain. Right. So long story short, I started on a journey of healing myself with acupuncture, chiropractic, meditation, because I was an emotional train wreck. Mm. Um, I, I wasn't really functional. I was struggling with depression. And, um, you Sounds know, my, like lifestyle, my lifestyle of success and going for lunches with clients and, and having, you know, eating and fine dining and traveling and all that, it crashed. Yeah. You know, I had none of that anymore. So I would say that that was sort of a, you know, pivotal time in my awakening. Yeah. All so, those events combined. I mean, talk about dark night of the soul. This is like dark well, months. Yeah. Well, yeah. You got to call it what you want, man. It was dark. <laughs> it was yeah. so dark. And there was nobody keep in mind. This was in 1991. Mm -hmm. So there was no internet. There was right. no really reference material for me. I truly had to figure it out one foot in front of the other. I, oh. The meditation and the yoga and the massage um, occasionally, the sitting on the beach for one hour a week, because that was all the energy I could muster up was to get myself there. Mm -hmm. So all of these things were, you know, were all guide point posts to slow down. Mm -hmm. And I found this acupuncturist who said to me, you know, when I told her what the doctor diagnosed me, she goes, you know, we don't, it, we don't talk about it like that. We don't diagnose this like that. She goes, we see energy channels. And when the energy channels don't flow, it creates some symptoms, mm -hmm. but we don't label it something. And I think that was pivotal for me because I started to think outside the box in terms of what I had and my diagnosis. I started thinking in terms of energy flowing, being in a flow, healing myself naturally, and really listening to myself at a deeper level than ever before. Mm. That's where that so intuition that was the beginning. <laughs> that was, what's that? That's where that intuition came in. Well... I think I was always extremely intuitive. However, it was all, it was pretty much shut off. Like suppressed you know, memory. Because I, yeah. I, like, in listening to your podcast introduction, you know, I too come from a Catholic background. Yeah. So, you know, over the years, that's really drilled out of you, right? You're yeah. not, you're kind of a crazy person if you We're say. Like re recovering Catholics. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, you know, my family would discount when I would say things they would, if I'd say black, they'd say white. So we were always at odds in terms of just trusting that if, mm. you know, so there was just always invalidation for who I was as I was growing up. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I got my, I healed myself. I started to do better. Yeah. I um, started 
um, some entrepreneurial endeavors. I started using gemstones um, to make some real high-end jewelry and started exporting that internationally. And it was quite successful. Um, and then when I, I realized I'm tired of being a starving artist, mm. I, th- I said to myself, okay, well, I've got to go back into the corporate world. And what can I do that allows me to meditate? I can go swimming at lunch. I don't want to drive, you know, a long way to the office on the freeway. So I had all these parameters and what it took shape of was working at home. Mm. So that was in 1996. I was actually a early adopter of the telecommuting, they used to call it, Mm. you know, of working at home. Right. And so I I got myself another six figure job. I started making the best money I've ever made. And, and, um, and, and I did a little bit of traveling and I started building up my reserves and I wanted to do some spiritual travel. Mm -hmm. Something was calling me. And I started hearing this, this little like call. And, you know, it was a strange thing. And it was like a chant and a, and a, a little melo- melodic s- song. I didn't know where it was coming from. Does it sound like tribal? It did. Wow. And then I had okay. a picture. I've heard something similar to that before. Okay. Ironic, so yeah. then I got this picture of this little man with dark skin. Hmm. And he was standing in a forest-like environment. And he continued to repeat this song. It was like a call. And then I got this brochure from, um, I don't even think she was a friend at that point, but this woman in the mail. And it was about a trip to Peru. Mm. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go if I get my tax return, because then I could afford it, right? Well, guess what? The tax return came and I went down to Peru. And I worked, um, it was an incredible journey um, with this group. And there was an ayahuasca journey. Mm. Now, keep in mind, this is 1997. (laughs) So (laughs) I had no research on ayahuasca. Way before it, yeah, is what it is now, yeah. I had no experience. I had no one to talk to. I did have no idea what I was stepping into. And I did it because of the voice and Mm. the calling. And so I cried from San Diego to Miami to, um, I think we landed in Lima. Mm. Um, I I felt like I was dying. And I remember people and strangers in the plane, you know, trying to comfort because I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. The the medicine's already working before you've even. Oh yeah. It was already working. Yeah. I had also been on a two on a, on a 30 day detox. Oh, wow. That's um, powerful. And so, and I, and I started to sort of build back my biome, my gut biome mm. for maybe just a few weeks before. Um, not a lot, but I was really clear. I was really cleaned out inside. So I get down there. I have no idea what we're in for. Um, working with the shaman in the jungle kind of was what the brochure right. said. Right. <laughs> and so, so that was my oh, first man. experience of, of, of taking a journey with that. And it was pretty incredible because um, there were two, two um, days that we participated. And the first day I had um, this massive headache that was going to blow my head off. And I had three shaman praying over me and rattling and singing and chanting. And it went on and on and on and on until all of a sudden I felt this gray wisp of smoke coming out of my third eye. And in that moment, I knew exactly who it was. And it was another spiritual healer that I had been working with in San Diego that called himself a, a shaman. And he oh. was sucking my life force energy and using my psychic abilities to em- empower his own abilities. Wow. And that blew my mind. That's I, I mean, intense. <laughs> 
I was like, uh, what's yeah. this? You know, <laughs> oh, like, shit. so I kind of just, again, you know, a lot of people were vomiting around me. There was two other people that did not vomit. I didn't vomit. Yeah, I haven't either so far in my journeys. So, so were you doing yours with a shaman or with somebody that was guiding you in a sacred environment? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I went, I went down to soul quest down in Florida and they would bring, bring in shamans, um, from, from the jungle, um, okay. various different, um, tribes and, uh, different cultures, um, different areas they were coming from, but, um, yeah, we, we had a shaman there, um, and medicine woman, so. Lisa, now, are you, this is something you've done many journeys, have you? Um, I have done uh, for myself. Okay. So y- you see, for me, um, the next day, I had a, a, a mind, another mind blowing, but different type of experience because yeah. I saw yeah. myself come through um, a diamond shape mm. star system. And the only thing I knew at the moment was it was a stargate Mm. and, or the Southern, it was a Southern cross, but the message I got was it was a stargate. And I saw myself shooting through into the earth plane as a star seed coming to the planet. And I had a sense that it was early Egypt, kind of like in the middle East, it could have been Iraq or one of those countries all around there. But I knew in that moment, I came and I seeded a human body. Mm. And um, I haven't researched any more than that. I didn't need to know any more than that. Right. Pretty much that was the end of my journey. I got some messages of what I'm here for, et cetera. But it was understanding that in that moment, oh, I knew yeah. that my next journey was going to Egypt. Mm-hmm. And I had no idea how I was going to get there, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and it was after I've been to Egypt now 14 times and had some incredible spiritual journeys without medicine. Right. And I truly have gotten you to are the point. medicine. Well, I truly believe that medicine, you know, again, I, my personal opinion is that we don't need it. Right. No, if, I agree. if you have yeah. a teacher that can assist you in helping you release the blocks mm. that are, are wanting to be activated for your opening and your ascension, I don't think we need these external devices. And my concern is it's gotten so commercialized yep. and people yep. are truly just relying on that and going, Ooh, you know, yep. and they're not internalizing the lesson or they get some amazing trip, but they're not walking the talk or they're not following it. So in a way, I think that's detrimental, not only to yep. the individual, but to the planet. Yeah, I, I, I definitely want to have the traditional authentic experience in the jungle. Um, it, for me, financially at the time, um, to get that experience here in the States was a blessing. And I'm oh, thankful. Yeah. And the community I've met down there and the people I've met through that. I mean, if I wouldn't have uh, sat with mother ayahuasca, I probably wouldn't be doing this podcast right now. Wouldn't have went up and had the courage to do stand up comedy. I mean, I, I don't oh, simply really? like, I didn't know you did that. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. I've done a couple of sets, nothing too crazy, but I mean, I'm not like giving full, uh, full, um, responsibility for what I've accomplished to, ayahuasca but it definitely like gave me the kick in the butt i needed of like you can do this you're you're the one holding yourself back you're making all these excuses and i guess it got me there quicker than i i would have but like i said there's well you don't know that yeah yeah exactly that's That's just the the unknown that's the route i took you know Right. And, and, you know, like I had that experience, I went, I didn't go into it for a drug related experience. I would always caution people to, you know, really, because you can really have some bad shit happen. And I I witnessed other research. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, um, so yeah, so, so that was sort of, you know, it's funny, sometimes I gloss over that um, Mm. because the next big, there was, it just sa- seems like there was so many, there's another bigger event. Oh, your story is all event. like blowing my mind. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
I love it. Yeah. So, so the next year I went to Egypt. Wow. And so, um, same thing happened. I didn't have the money, mm. but I put it out there to the universe. Okay. If I'm meant to be like a little, you know, sassy ass, I said, well, you know, if it's meant to be, you know, show me the money kind of thing, you know? Yeah. So I, that happened again, the tax return came in and, uh, I had some money and away I went. And I mean, it, it, it could have been a trigger from the ayahuasca experience in the jungle, yeah. But other, I wasn't the only one having these experiences. When you go to Egypt, um, you know, you can be walking down, um, a, let's say, in one of the temples and you catch a glimpse of, let's say, a statue of Sekhmet. She's the goddess with a lion face and a female body. She was known as the healer of healers. And she would come to me often, but you start seeing, seeing granite statues smile at you. Mm. Their little, her little whiskers would go up on her mouth and the staff she was holding, you'd see her hand rise like, as if to sure. say, no. you think you're losing your mind and you're right. straight. There's no, no right. hanky panky, you know, medicine. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, yeah. I remember looking at people and going, did you just see that? What did you, am I losing my mind here? Did that really yeah. happen? So those kinds of things started happening in Egypt. And of course, it, countless messages, information, um, ahas, awarenesses of being there before, of yeah. walking the corridors, you know, lifetimes before. So it's kind of like a merge of lifetimes that kind mm. of like layer over each other. Yeah, and again, it's, it's ironic you, know, you say that. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, um, no, no. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, like, uh, I had a lot of Egyptian themes and multiple ayahuasca experiences and um, a past life regression I had done. I also had a life in Egypt that came up in that. So I, I definitely resonate with what you're saying. So, Do you know what ironic. that symbol is on your cap? Uh, this is the Taurus. Oh, okay. I wasn't thinking that. I was thinking of Horus. Oh, yeah, the Aya Horus. I, I do have a beanie with the Aya Horus. But on there's it too. <laughs> in, in the temples, there are the symbols, the yeah. horns, and yeah. it's like the 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 third eye, the circle, mm. and the horns to heaven. Mm. Yeah. It's like an altar to heaven. Yeah. Right. So you're just bringing in the energy. So yeah, um, Egypt was profound. Every single time I go is profound. I think it matters who's your lead, you know, mm. the group lead um, and, and the intention that the group has. But it was after I, I fell in love with, a, with an Egyptian, which almost every American woman does. And uh, now I laugh about it, but um, I, I was buying some beads um, cause I would mention I was making jewelry and these were beads that were collected from the, the mountain, from the Valley of the Kings, wow. people were living on the edge of the mountain and they would scurry in, in through the back wall of their home, trying to find, um, antiquities mm. and or tunnels or whatever. Right. So I, I was going to pay these for these beads from this friend of a friend and uh, you had to sort of uh, find somebody that you could trust. And second of all, it was like through the friend in the village that I was able to find these particular beads. Mm. So when I went back to pay, um, they brought out the pot. And I said, well, no, thanks. I don't smoke. And again, this is back in 1998. So I, I've tried pot before. It doesn't do much for me. So I'm a bit, I'm, I get higher on a light beer, you know, than right. I do. Pot. It just doesn't <laughs> do it. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. So um, it's not been my path. And, and so, well, this guy, Egyptian, you know, starts screaming and yelling and I'm the only one there and he's all pissed off. He's bent out of shape because I've now insulted him for mm. saying, no, thank you. I don't smoke. So he's sh sh shouting so loud and I'm kind of scared. I'm the only girl there and I'm sitting on the only plastic chair in the room. You know, they're all just standing around. And so I thought, well, I've tried it before. Nothing's happened. So 
I will just, you know, participate. The joint will go around a couple of times and I'll be out of here. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't happen like that. Um, the joint did go around a couple of times and I had little puffs on it. And when, when, when it was finished and everybody just popped up, they're ready to rock out the door and I couldn't move. Mm. I, I was paralyzed. I was frozen in the chair. And what I, 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 I don't remember saying anything, but I must have put my hands out in front of me like this. I'm thinking I started seeing myself standing behind my body and started floating up and I could see everybody in the room. There might've been eight or 10 guys. I could see their, their life. It was like playing on a, on a video screen or like I was at circuit city and there were 10 different life lines playing out, you know, different stories. And so I was kind of freaked out. And so I must have said something like, Do, I, I, can I have some water? And I, all I thought was, if I just splash my face, it'll bring me back. I'll, I won't pass out. I won't leave the body. I won't. Well, again, that didn't happen like that. And all I remember is getting that they, they did pour and it was like slow motion. My friend walking to me, pouring water in my hand. And then I remember getting the water in my hands right about here and thinking, oh shit, this is going to run my mascara. It's gonna... <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me. And so um, that's when I crashed. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I don't remember the next part. So, so there's a couple things here. I've had a couple of downloads of where I went and what happened. Mm. Um, what I was told, but it wasn't all immediate. Okay. So what happened was apparently they were pounding my chest and they were um, screaming at me to get, or screaming to get an ambulance. They dragged me outside. Everybody's scrambled because if anything happened to an American, they'd all lose their entire livelihood. They'd be all thrown in jail. It'd be over. Sure. So um, they dragged me out. They were yelling for a taxi. They screamed my name through the whole village. Amira. And uh, to this day, they, you know, see certain people and they shout Amira. <laughs> so it's wow. kind of funny. But yeah, so they Amazing. propped me up in a truck and they put my head out the window. I was in the passenger side of this pickup truck. And the pickup trucks there are like little taxis because the whole bed of the truck has benches on them. Mm. And so people just ride right. back there. So my friend sat in the middle of this of the cab in the front and then there was the driver and apparently they were barreling down the road with my head out the window trying to give me some air and when I I one of this part is what I remember is shooting through the sky again there seems to be this theme and I was shooting like a light beam or a comet and I didn't know where I was going because I just saw stars mm. and then I saw the planet earth and it started getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm like, oh, that's a big place. How am I going to find myself? And then I heard the language of Arabic. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know that language. And so then, I, then it was like a thought, oh, I'm in Egypt. Oh, yeah, that's right. So I, it's like a GPS that I started to locate my body. And then it was almost like, so difficult to describe, but it, it was like I was trying to put on a wet, wet clothes or a wet, wet suit. Have you ever done that before? Yeah. Yeah. I and know what you mean. Yeah. It's sticky and it's cold right. and it's like, yeah, you have not to comforting struggle, at all. Right? <laughs> That's what it was feeling like to get into my body. Wow. And so it felt like ugh, 10 minutes. I'm, I'm sure it wasn't, but and it also you know, my eyes were closed, but the light was incredibly bright. And I couldn't, I, I, I was really, really struggling to open my eyes for the longest time. And I remember just sort of reaching and trying to find my friend. And I said, where are you taking me? Mm. And they freaked out. They started screaming and crying. And, 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 and then he says, well, we're taking you to the hospital. We're taking you to the hospital. And I'm like, 
I, I was really blissed out. I was really calm. I was really content and happy. Mm. And I felt like light, complete light. I said, man, I need a bathroom. But my gut was ready to explode, right? Okay. And I'm like, oh, I just need a bathroom. And they said, and I'm thinking, if they take me to the hospital, that's going to kill me. A little old hospital in, in the Valley of the Kings, out in out, it's called Corna, mm -hmm. outside of Luxor. Man, that's like <laughs> the rinky-dinky, most primitive hospital on the planet. I'm sure of it. And I, oh my God, the bacteria is going to kill me. Oh boy. <laughs> So I had no idea what had happened. Um, <clears throat> little by little, I started coming back more. Um, they had to carry me up two flights of stairs because I convinced them I needed a bathroom. So then the whole dialogue was, where can we get her to a bathroom? Because it needs to be like a European style bathroom, you know? And because in this village at the time, most people didn't have a regular toilet mm -hmm. or bathroom. They were just holes in the floor. Yeah. So they knew that I needed to sit down, right? right. <laughs> so this was a whole issue. <laughs> so we go into the bathroom and finally get up there and I won't let him leave the room. Well, again, this is another extreme cultural faux pas because Egyptian men are not allowed in private spaces with women at all. Mm, yeah. And they automatically thought we were having sex in the bathroom. Oh, God. Yeah, so so <laughs> the, the sister-in-law is pounding on the door, freaking out in Arabic, thinking something bad's going on in there, right? And this is haram. This is this is like against God. This is against Allah, you know, for this. <laughs> right. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm thinking I'm so proper because I was wearing a long dress and I had the dress pulled down over my legs so you couldn't see anything, right? And I'm right. just got my bum on the toilet. And I'm thinking, oh, this is so cool, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Little, you know. It's kind of funny. And so, um, well, little by little, he was sitting up on the tub. The tub was raised. And it, tears were just streaming down his face, tearing, streaming down his face. And he goes, you don't understand. He goes, you died. You died. He goes, doesn't your chest hurt? He was pounding with all his might on my chest to try and get my heart to start beating. He goes, your breathing stopped, your heart stopped. Wow. And I was still kind of blissed out. And then, um, you know, I told him I'm fine. I'm fine. And they helped me get to the bed and I laid down cause I couldn't walk. Mm. And so I, I was like, I don't know what happened to me. And I wasn't so worried about it, quite honestly, but I was laying there in the bed and there was an armoire across the room and looking into the wood grain, every time I look at it, I would see the goddess Sekhmet. She's the one with the lion face and yeah. the yeah, I'm familiar with body. That. And, and I'm like, holy shit. And I kept looking out the window where the little draperies were fluttering and I could see the green valley of the Nile. And I'm like, that's real. I'm not looking at that because that is, I, I don't know what, I'm not looking at that. I just kept looking outside. And so every time I looked at wood grain, I was seeing these beings and entities. Uh, my friend brought me an orange and some water and some yogurt because they figured right away that I was dehydrated, mm, which yeah, I probably yeah. was. Heat stroke. Yeah. Right. And yes, because I had detox before this trip too. Yeah. And so. <clears throat> Heat strokes are rough. I've had one. Well, and apparently so I did not know this, but a lot of people die from um, dehydration. Oh yeah. It's, sure. it's a huge cause of death. Oh Yeah. So, um, so there I was, um, and this orange, it was bizarre because the orange, I started seeing all the molecules in the oranges, in the orange, when it was cut in half, it was like, it was communicating to me. Mm. And, you know, somebody could say, well, you were really tripping out, well, you know, it's a hallucinogenic, but no, it was pot. Right. And, um, I, I'm not experienced with any of this stuff, so I can't say, all I can tell you is that connection to everything that is and was, was profound. Mm. And that care, that stayed with me for over 24 hours. So that isn't a hallucination. Wow. 
right? So it's like a moment of like premonition or like a aha, like a. Well, I didn't know what to call it, quite honestly. Um, That day, so I did start to recover my strength because that day I had to fly from Luxor to Cairo, Mm. Cairo to New York, New York, Atlanta, Atlanta, San Diego. So that was like a 22 hour journey ahead of me. Yeah. That's and so <laughs> I, um, my friend flew, um, he amazingly manifested a ticket from Luxor to Cairo. He had never flown before in his life. He was petrified of flying and I didn't know it, mm. but he was doing that to make sure I got the hell out of the country. Because again, if anything happened to me, you know, on their watch, their whole family would lose their entire livelihood. Everybody would mm. go to jail. Yeah. And the government had set that up because the year before that, in 1997, uh, Queen Hatshepsut Temple, there was a massacre that came out of the mountains and shot and killed 31 tourists. So they set up these very, you know, rigid parameters and anything that ever, if if anything happened to an American citizen, they'd they'd lose everything. Wow. So he... He really was careful to make sure that I was okay. And then I got to this airport and it was when I was in the airport in line, my tour, the tour guy that was with me um, throughout the previous two weeks, she was there. And so I said to her, who's this lion with the, you know, Egyptian, the lion body, female, female body lion. She goes, oh, that's Sekhmet. She's the healer of healers. Mm. She was known in the ancient times of the medicine, uh, the doctor's patron saint. So um, that began my journey of healing and working with Sekhmet. It was a powerful entity. And quite honestly, having been raised Catholic, I never believed in any of these entities Mm. or any of these. I never resonated truly with Egyptology and the gods and and all of that stuff. But that's the moment it started to come alive for me. And I realized, um, and it was an incremental process that these beings exist and they're alive and they're not in granite statues. There's so much more to them. And that's when sort of the multidimensional reality started to seep into my consciousness. I mean, I knew about angels and I knew about talking to dead people because that happened to me, you know, a lot. Yeah. And, and so, but I, it, didn't, it didn't really enter my consciousness of the vastness of it and the reality of it and the, the you know, just what that all could mean. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, you always hear stories of like these energy vortexes of, you know, certain places around the world. And, you know, I think Egypt is popularly talked about as a place where it's, you know, it's like you're stepping into a different dimension in a sense. It's, it's, it's fascinates the hell out of me. I, I, I need to get over there. Um, well, I'm planning a, a group trip this year. So in no, are you uh, really? late October, November, yeah, yeah, that will absolutely be a spiritual journey specifically with specific meditations and, 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 and personal journeying, you know, yeah. but I wanted to add to that, what you said about the dimensions. And mm. this is what I believe is happening in terms of the ascension process and the awakening. Yeah, I, 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 I listened to your story of the cabal, the Illuminati and the cabal and right. s- secret societies or the elite, you know, we could, let's lump it all together. Right? right. I started to understand that this was way bigger than that. Right. <laughs> and that, that we're in a process that started 20,000 years ago mm. with the fall of Atlantis. Mm. And that we have agreed as part of this whole fall, because we stepped away from the golden age of being in the fourth dimension, where you think and you create, and or living in the in in the fourth dimension is what we just talked about, is beings and entities, or talking to our deceased loved ones who have crossed over through to the other side of life, or whether it's um, 
even the dynamics of what's being played out on the planet, I think is in a fourth dimension. Mm. 